All right, hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker, and with me today, I'm excited to have on, for the second time, my friend Edwin Dorsey from The Bear Cave. Edwin, how's it going? Uh, Andrew, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for our discussion today. Hey, I'm excited. Just We were doing some discussion pre-podcast, so I'm really excited to talk about this one. Um, I start every podcast by pitching my guests, but because you're so unique, I'm going to start this podcast with a disclaimer first. Nothing on here is investing advice. You know, the Bear Cave is a short focused uh, newsletter, so we might discuss shorting at some point. I think we're probably going to talk about warrants. Warrants and shorting, super risky. Please, nothing on here investing advice. Everyone should remember that. Uh, that out the way, let me start this podcast the way I do every podcast by pitching you. People can listen to the first podcast for the original pitch, but you know, I love the Bear Cave. Super unique product, really highlights and celebrates uh, what I think is a important misunderstood piece of the market, that short selling. And I mean, since our first podcast, the Bear Cave has just exploded. Mentions in Institutional Investor. Was there a New York Times shout out? Do I remember that correctly? I don't think so. I don't think so. But one day, Andrew. <laughs> one day. But there was definitely Institutional Investor shout outs left and right. I, I, you know, I was one of the first subscribers. Now there's thousands of us. It's, it's just awful. It's just awful. But I, I really enjoy it. Great write-ups, love highlighting the short selling, and, and you've broken some big stories on some pretty buzzy companies too. We, we can go to the company we're going to talk about in a second, but any of the articles in the past couple months that you've done really jump out as like, this is something I'm really proud of? So the, the most read thing in my newsletter was when I wrote about Robert Smith early on, because I think a lot of the media was focusing on the potential tax evasion stuff. But it turns out he's got a lot of issues where at least his private equity firm may not have acted the most ethically. Um, it seems like they use a lot of their portfolio companies to buy old portfolio companies. Some board members alleged that inflated valuations. Uh, you know, one of his friends got was raided by the FBI and he'd invested in his friend's funds. There, there's a lot of kind of odd things with Robert Smith and Vista that I, I think the traditional media was missing, but I, the Bear Cave news that I was able to talk about. You know what I think the Bear Cave is, is best at? Not that you're not best at everything, but I think what you're best at is very quickly, when something's got three or four red flags, the bear cave will come out with something that says, hey, here are these red flags. This is what I'm noticing. And maybe I haven't done all the work yet. And maybe I'm just throwing these red flags out for a reporter to go pull on these threads and see if there's anything there. But here are these red flags that I've used a FOIA request or, you know, I, I've noticed changes in the net last three 10Ks or something like here's some red flags you should be aware of. That's where I think the bear cave like really excels and it's best at. I think back to like Triterus, the it's a SPAC IPO that merged and you came out and you said, look, look at all these red flags. And I think there was a lot of, I'm underselling how much work you did there because there was a lot of other interesting stuff, but you yeah. you pointed out five red flags and two, two bombs, I would say. And then two, three weeks later, there were four more short sellers that built off those red flags and turned them all into bombs. But that's really where I think the bear flag sells at. And like the Robert Smith thing, you said, here's seven red flags, no one's noticing pull on these threads and I bet you'll probably find something. Andrew, that's exactly right. Like the goal isn't to give a comprehensive short idea with the valuation and earnings estimates and stuff like that. The goal is really to highlight, you know, a few big things that the market's missing about a company, usually negative things that the market's just missed. And then somebody could take that and run with it and already have the first three or four innings of research done and have like a great setup to now go research a company and see if it's actually going to be a good position for them. So, so I love, I, that's exactly how I sell it. I'll, I'll kind I like interesting red flags people are missing, but it's not going to be a fully comprehensive to get you to want to short it. And as you know, recently I did my first long write up. Um, hey, I so. love that you're doing my work for me because that's the perfect transition. We're going to talk about uh, not your short ideas, your first long write up that you put out. Obviously, very high conviction idea. I'll let you disclose your position and everything, but I, I know this is a big bet. Uh, the company is Autonomo. They're going public through a SPAC with software. It's a merger with Software Acquisition 2. The ticker is currently SAII. Uh, that'll change on when the merger finishes in the next couple months. But I'll flip it over to you. Why don't you give an overview of who they are, why you're so attracted to them? So Autonomo is an Israeli connected car data company that's currently going public through a SPAC with the deal expected to close in early April. You know, full disclosure, just like you said, none of this is investment advice. It's my largest personal position. I own a lot of the stock and warrants and a few units. So, you know, I'm, I might be biased here. I won't be selling it right after this interview, but, you know, take that everything with, I say with a grain of salt, not investment advice. Um, Autonomo, Israeli car data company that's 
going public through a SPAC. And it's kind of a new industry where traditionally cars like generate a lot of data, but it's not stored. It's just like lost after it's generated. While new cars now that are being built um, can generate a ton of data, like the speed it's driving, where it's driving, any maintenance issues going on with the car, stuff like that. But that that is stored and transferred to a, a cloud, which is either maintained by Autonomo or Autonomo's main competitor, Wejo. So right now, there's a, you know tens of millions of cars currently on the road that when they're being driven, the data from that car is being transferred to these third-party clouds. And what's really cool is there's going to be a lot of uses, some of which aren't readily obvious for this data. And Autonomo is going to be a middleman, basically a marketplace for this data. Consumers will own it, and they'll be able to sell it to people who want this data, like insurance companies and a host of other um, players. And Autonomo will be a middleman, basically taking a fee for like maintaining the data. Perfect. No, I think that's a great thing. So uh, that's a great overview. And I think the first and most obvious pushback, so I, you know, this is a startup company, right? They're trying yeah. to be the middleman for data, a car. We, we'll talk about some of the other things, but obviously, you know, an insurance company is going to want the data for how everyone's driving and stuff. But I think the first pushback here is, hey, Autonomo is trying, the car company owns that data and then gives it or sells it to Autonomo, Weijo, whoever the competitor is. Why is the car, like, there aren't that many of them. Why are they going to sell it to Autonomo at a level that would, like, make let Autonomo make money? Why wouldn't they keep that for themselves and then just go and sell it directly to Progressive? Like, I think that's just the first and most obvious pushback right there. So I, I would say first, the driver it will, will own the data. There's so if I'm driver. driving the car, I actually own the data, not you. GM. You have full consent over the data. If you don't want your data shared, you won't be able to share it. But we'll, how it'll probably work, and again, this is a new industry, is an insurance company will say, hey, we'll give you a $20 discount if you let us see your driving data. Or a leasing company will say, hey, let us sell your data, but you'll get $20 a month off your lease. That's probably how it's going to play out, but Autonomo does not own the data. What Autonomo is doing that's really complex, and the reason there's a need for a middleman like Autonomo, is data regulation. In the US and in Europe is becoming a huge thing, and it's very complicated. Um, in the US, depending on who's driving the car, there might be different regulations on how you need to treat the data, and you need to manage it differently for different drivers. In the US, it looks like every state is going to have different regulations on how you can treat driver data. Can you monetize it? Can you not monetize it? Under what circumstances can you monetize it? How does it need to be stored? Does it need to be anonymized? There's going to be 50 different regulations for 50 different states, and you need to start managing the data differently as soon as a car crosses state lines. In Europe, there's GDPR, which is very restrictive. There, there's tons of regulations around data, which make a lot of these car companies say, hey, we don't want to build our own cloud to store all this consumer data and then try to be a marketplace. We want to partner with the middleman like Autonomo, who's going to worry about all the data compliance stuff for us. I think it's also difficult to normalize and anonymize the data between all these cars. So that, that's part of the reason there's a need for a middleman like Autonomo. And then on the customer side, if you're an insurance company like Progressive, if you're a city planner who wants car data, it helps to have a middleman where you can go to make one deal to get all the data rather than going to 10 different individual car companies or 50 different individual consumer groups or something like that. It's really a place because of regulation on one side and centralization for the other that you, you, it makes sense to have one or two big middlemen um, playing in this market. Perfect. So l let me dive a little bit more into making sure I understand uh, uh, autonomy because that's actually a little bit different than I, I, my understanding of it. So uh, one of their partners is Ford, right? So when they partner with Ford, Ford's going to put, there's tons of sensors on your car and stuff that are collecting data. Those, Ford's putting those sensors in, right? That, that's not autonomous sensors or anything. Yeah. And then for what they've done is Ford struck a deal with Autonomo that Autonomo can collect and manage this data. But what has to, what also has to happen is when Ford or the Ford dealership or whatever sells your car, you have to consent to Autonomo releasing that data or does Autonomo just keep collecting it until you consent to someone else using that data? I'm not 100% sure. I believe Autonomo gets the consent to collect it. And then they also need your consent to transfer it, let's say to an insurance company who wants to use it. Um, 
to price things. But Autonomo does not own the data. They don't buy the data. They're just storing the data in the cloud with compliance with all these data regulations. Um, but but, but they, they're not buying and selling data. I, I think it's more just a marketplace to host data and transfer it. Perfect. Um, and one thing I would also add is, you know, it's not so much that there's tons of new sensors being added, like this data always existed. It was just kind of being disregarded. Like one thing people don't know is like rear view cameras apparently in cars are kind of running 24 seven or whenever yeah. the car is driving, not just when you're in reverse. And there can be a lot of value collected from rear view cameras. It can show where like potholes are in a road. It can show if there's like anything blocking a road or like any accidents. Um, so, so that's like kind of one example where like this data that had been disregarded, review camera feeds can actually be valuable in some use cases. Yeah, and, and then, go ahead, go ahead, please. You know, and the, you know, other things, it's it just like, you know, the data being collected, I think they, they say they collect 150 different attributes, but the main thing is just how you drive. Where are you driving? What times are you driving? What speeds are you driving? How fast are you braking? Are you an erratic driver? Are you a safe driver? Are you turning like crazy? I think that's going to be um, a lot of the main data. And then there's kind of like two buckets of use cases. There's going to be like individual use cases where certain companies will want individual data on driver drivers to help offer products to that driver. And then there's going to be kind of bulk use cases where you could imagine a government or city planner probably wants to know how 10,000 different cars in their area are driving for the purpose of city planning and stuff like that. Um, so th that's kind of how I think about it. Let's go to those use cases in a second because I want to get there, but I just want to button up. So uh, Autonomo has 16 OEM partnerships right now that cover 80% of the market, right? Uh, and one thing you wonder, are the, you know, a partnership with Ford or BMW or something, are these exclusive partnerships or are they locking these guys up and they're the only ones who kind of get access to all of this data or are these non-exclusive partnerships? That's a great question, Andrew. I, I believe they're exclusive. I don't know how long they're exclusive for. I know the competitor Weijo has General Motors exclusive for like seven years. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's it, it's an exclusive. I don't know how long it's locked up for. Um, I don't think it's terribly long though, but that's a very good question. That's yeah, we, just one of the things that I think of like, you know, SiriusXM, which I, I had a history with, you know, one of the things with them is they're exclusive in the things and obviously they own the XM radio and stuff. And once they're put into the cars, it's, you know, you know, a, a car company, when they plan, they're planning the 2025 models today, right? So once you get yeah. put in, it's very sticky, but it's a long process. But since Ford's already collecting all this data and stuff, like, I, I do wonder what the value of that partnership is, because if it was all autonomous um, sensors in there and stuff, you know, that would be incredibly sticky. But if they're yeah. not exclusive partnerships, you can see the worry that Ford's just going to say, oh, yeah, anybody who wants to try to figure out how to mine this data can take this data off of us. That, that That's true. Um, you know, autonomous is better positioned than its competitors for a few reasons. One is you can't just say anyone can take this data because you, there's tons of regulations around data. You, you want to make sure this person's established and they're, they're going to be big. You can't just partner with a random startup doing it. You need to make sure that they're following all the data compliance issues. Um, autonomous right now has the biggest lead. They have about 40 million connected cars. Their competitor, um, uh, Weijo, has about 10 million connected cars and like a fifth as many partnerships. Um, so autonomous kind of like come out of this running and what the CEO Ben Volkow says is this is probably going to be a winner take most industry like other industries where just one person gets the scale gets the size and once a once a person has that size then there's kind of this natural effect where you know all the customers would prefer to deal with one person in the middle rather than like 10 different middlemen. No that's um, great. Uh, you know, I'll jump ahead to another pushback because I, I know the quote you're, you're saying, it, it was probably because I was in your write-up and when I was prepping, I, it stuck out to me. But I think his quote was, look, there's one Airbnb, there's one Fiverr, right? This is a winner-take-all marketplace. Whoever wins gets 80% and the remaining 20% is divided among all the other competitors, right? So winner-take-all market. And I get that. But when I think of Airbnb, you know, I think of a thing where supply and demand are insanely fragmented, right? Those are the types of marketplaces where it's a winner take all marketplace. When I think of a place where supply and demand aren't quite as fragmented, you know, there can be room for more than one people. None are jumping off the top of my head, like Expedia booking, you know, there's only like 10 major hotel companies in US. So there's two major players there. I, I'm not quite sure, but I do see something where it's, hey, the supply here is 
the top 10 OEMs, right? That's almost all of the market for cars. And then the demand, I do think there's going to be a lot of things that demand, but it's not unlimited demand, right? The demand is big government agencies, local city municipalities for planning, insurance companies, probably some more. But, you know, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of people who are demanding this data. We're probably talking dozens to hundreds. So I don't see a super fragmented marketplace that suggests like Airbnb type qualities. Does that make sense? Uh, on the demand side, I'm not sure I'd agree with you. I think there are going to be like hundreds and hundreds of people trying to get this data coming up with innovative use cases. And let's talk about the use cases soon. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> on, on this, uh, you know, you might be right. Like it's a very new industry and we'll see how it plays out. Uh, my guess and what Ben Volkow has also said, the CEO is like the auto industry is very slow moving. It could take two or three years just to get like a contract on. It took them years to convince somebody to sign with Autonomo. Um, I'm not, you know, there's smart car in the US that I think is trying to do something like this. Uh, I, I really think there's only three or four players right now. Um, and my guess is most people won't want to go. My guess is if you do want to do something different, you're going to have somebody captive, kind of like how GM is like taking over Weijo and is trying to say Weijo is like going to be GM's platform. Um, you might see that with some of the other big automakers, but my guess is most just want a platform where they're just not going to need to worry about it. That's going to give them and their consumers a good deal. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense though. I, I do, you know, I think Tesla keeps all of their data for themselves and you do wonder like, does everyone look to go with the Tesla and keep everything internal and almost monetize it there? But obviously Autonomo already has the partnership. So it looks like, no, please continue. Absolutely. So let's. So what, what, the coolest thing to me reading about this was the use cases. Yep. Like, how can you use all this data? What, what, what's, what's actually going to be the use cases for? So the most obvious, and you mentioned this, is usage-based insurance. Insurance companies want to know who's a good driver and who's a bad driver. And like, there's no better way to get that data than by like actually getting the car data itself. So so now you can imagine. You know, an insurance company will say, hey, if you share your connected car data with us, on average, you'll get like a $15 lower rate. Autonomo gets some take for being the middleman and exchanging the data. Consumers say, absolutely. And insurance companies get a perfect look onto how good of a driver you are over like a 30 day period or however long. And they can use that to set insurance rates really effectively. Um, the, you, this might also hurt some other innovative insurance companies like Root and Metro Mile that right now use an app in your phone to try to track like where your phone goes and in effect how good of a driver you are. But, but the car data itself is going to be the best way to get this data on consumer driving habits. There's no fraud. You can't like, you know, it's perfect. Um, so that's one of the big use cases, and that's a huge industry. Another use case is for fleet management. So there's a lot of entities that have thousands of cars, most obviously rental car companies. You know, it's tough to keep tabs on how many miles are being driven on each car. Are there any potential maintenance issues on any car? Do any cars have like a close to flat tire? Any cars not running smoothly? Did one car get driven excessively in like weird conditions recently? Um, it's tough to keep tabs on all that for thousands and thousands of cars. Uh, you could Imagine a fleet like an Avis a rental car company coming in and saying, hey, Autonomo, all our cars are going to be connected cars. We want you to help us like identify potential problems like with our fleet. And Avis is both an investor and a customer of Autonomo right now, which I think shows like this isn't just a potential use case. This is actually happening right now. Those are the two obvious usage based insurance and fleet management. If I, if I could just jump in and something that strikes me, as you say, yeah. you know, with the Avis example, you know, Avis buys from, it's not just GM cars, right? They buy from tons of OEMs, right? When I go, there's always like 15 different options. Yeah. I'm sure they try to centralize a little bit to get bulk discounting, but you know, with an Avis or another thing with an Uber, right? Like their fleets are massive and they're all different brands. And that does speak to what you're saying. Hey, the uh, Autonomo is the largest guys. They have 80% of the market. If you're a rental car company looking for fleet management, autonomous size and scale is a huge benefit when you work with them, right? Because they've got deals with the majority of the OEMs that they want to do. You can really only go to them or it sounds like we chose smaller and different, but you know, I do think this is exactly your point. Their scale, their size means they can strike deals with rental agencies or an Uber is really fascinating to me getting more data on how their drivers are driving and stuff. They can get that data, they can strike it because of their size. And in that way, winning begets winning. 
You win Hertz because you've got connections to all the OEMs. Then all the OEMs want to work with you because Hertz says, hey, you have to have connections with Autonomo because we need that data for our rental management center. Great flywheel cycle. Uh, uh, just, yeah. Great point. Great point, Andrew. And let's talk about even more of the use cases because I don't think it's always readily obvious to people how much you can do. Um, so, so in leasing, and uh, you know, it, it, it having a car's data will help determine the residual value because you know how, how many miles you drive is good. But are you driving under normal conditions? Are you driving under weird conditions? Are you driving on dirt roads a lot? That can you, you can get from vehicle data. Another thing that's kind of interesting that I hadn't thought of is apparently you know in, in banking in the credit card industry, you know, there's a lot of times a low credit score person applies for a credit card and they're rejected just because it's tough for banks and card companies to determine whether or not they should trust this person who is like on imperfect credit, even though a lot of them like should be getting it if the banks had more perfect information. Uh, some banks think you can get uh, based on someone's driving habits, um, determine whether or not they're a credit worthy person. For example, is this person speeding a lot or are they like a responsible driver because you'd imagine responsible drivers are probably going to be more responsible from your credit or like what locations do they drive do they drive during normal hours or do they go a lot on 2 a.m drives like so, so banking would be another area where if a bank was unsure on whether or not they should loan money to a customer share us your car data and we might be able to underwrite more efficiently is that is that bankers like is that their gut, how they lend, or is there data that actually says like people who speed are worse credits? I, I think I think that credit card companies in particular have been interested in this and have said like th this is a thing. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, but again, it's such a new and like you know industry you don't know yet. Um, so, some more interesting things like uh, electric vehicles. Um, right now, there's more and more electric vehicles. Those electric vehicles need to be charged at home. Um, how do you determine how much of your energy bill, your electricity bill, is from charging your electric vehicle? Right now, there isn't like a great way to determine that, but you know, using autonomous data, you can say this is how much you spent on electricity at your home to charge your electric vehicle, so you can get a tax rebate or get it written off for work or something like that. That's just like you know an interesting use case. Another use case is emergency services. Now, when cars get in accidents, you know, cars can probably tell if they're in an accident. They're transferring their data to Autonomo in real time. I believe there's a third party company that's trying to build an app that'll dial 911 directly for any big accidents where like 911 would be needed. So when someone gets in an accident in a connected car, bam, the car knows something's wrong. They're transferring all this messed up data. This third party monitors the data and they'll say, hey, this was a bad accident at four people in the car, this speed, this is what happened, and dial 911 directly. Um, you know, in those 10 or 15 seconds can save lives. Um, another case, uh, so, so those are just some of like the cases where like individual car data on an individual scale can be really useful. And I think there's just dozens and dozens more. And if you listen to the CEO Ben Volkow talk, he'll go on for hours about all the different use cases. And he's always like, I'm being surprised at all the different things that can be used. That's for individual level cars. And then at a bigger level, it can be super helpful for city planning to understand where people drive, where's traffic usually, what are the bottlenecks? Um, uh, uh, there was a point, I hate it when I blink on things. Uh, no, one no, more thing, I, go ahead. For city planning and for real estate, right? Like I could imagine real estate developers wanna go and buy this data and see where people are driving. And not only that, it could be really interesting, like, hey, you know, uh, the people who drive Ferraris uh, over uh, over indexed to driving down this road. You know, I'm sure they, they probably know most of the roads, but maybe there's a couple off things. And like, if you're building the new Louis Vuitton store, or, you know, you could, you could imagine how they, this would be a really useful way to index who is driving where and to think about building real estate portfolios, different properties, all that type of stuff. And absolutely, absolutely. The, the one thing I just forgot was hedge funds might want this data, you know, as part, part, part of a broader plan to try to like track the movement of people and goods. You can imagine trying to get the connected car data for trucks to see like where trucks are moving. There's there, there's going to be so, so, so many uses for you it. You need to send that idea to Autonomo right now because that is a $10 billion idea. I could imagine every large prop trading shop is just paying these guys for granular data on where every car in America is to do the old 
the old parking lot thing at a much more granular level. So it's incredible. And then back to something we talked about earlier, these sensors on cars, both rear view sensors, like side cameras, all these things are generally running just whenever the car is running, even if they're not displaying that to you in screen. Um, so, so you could imagine if you have 20,000 connected cars in the city, those connected cars are just good at identifying potholes on the road. And somebody could make software just to say, oh, like here's the 10 potholes every day that need like the most service because this is where cars are running over it. They look yep. the most extreme. You know, one, one, one thing the CEO mentioned is like the, 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 these, these cars with these cameras are good at like, you can detect open park, like in a parking lot, they can figure out where all the open spaces are. So you can imagine in the future, if there's enough connected cars, you always know where open parking spaces are because all the other camera data is being shared. It, it, it's really like, it's gonna be huge. It's gonna be, there's so much there. Let me go back to something you said earlier because I think it's a little counterintuitive. Um, you mentioned usage-based uh, car insurance is gonna be really interested in, in this, which is not counterintuitive, right? Obviously they'd love all the data they can to price out bad drivers and price good drivers, all that type of stuff. But you mentioned that this is gonna be dangerous for Root and Metro Mile, who are two, I'll call them startups that, you know, they use an app on your phone to track how you're driving, price you're driving and everything. And a lot of people think these are revolutionary growth companies that are gonna price out Geico and Progressive and stuff, right? Uh, and I think people who think that just, you know, you say, hey, we're going to get more data to these data driven tech companies that are redefining insurance. I would say, oh, that's a great thing. But you said this is going to be offered for them. So could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Absolutely. So just for anyone who doesn't know what root insurance is, it's a new app based insurance company. And what you do is you go to the app store, you download the root insurance app on your phone, and then the root insurance app will track your location 24 seven for two weeks. And the purpose of doing that is to, to determine whether or not you're a good driver. So in theory, they can tell when your iPhone's moving a certain way, whether or not you're in a car versus let's say a bicycle, they can tell based on your phone's like location, like whether you're in the passenger seat or driver's seat or back seat, so they can tell when you're the one driving the vehicle. And then based on the phone's movement, like GPS movement, they can tell, are you braking fat too fast? Are you speeding? Are you turning too aggressively? And you know, it's imperfect, but in theory, you know, they're gonna be able to get some some sense on whether or not you're a good driver. And they've told investors like, hey, we've got this model, we've got this new technology, it allow us to underwrite insurance much better than the traditional companies. They've got about, I think, a $4 billion valuation. So far, they've been losing a lot of money. They're heavily shorted. People are a little skeptical, but, but, but inv some investors think, hey, actually this technology is gonna work and ultimately they're gonna become good underwriters because of this technology. Now, the thing no one talks about is this is going to be obsolete in five years because Autonomo and Weijo will get the data directly from the cars. So, you know, phone data as a proxy for cars might be okay, but it's not going to be better than the car data itself. With phones, you can just turn your phone off. You can leave your phone at home. You might drive a little less during those two weeks. You might put your phone in somebody else's car. Your phone might die. The phone data itself might be perfect. The phone data might not be able to perfectly tell whether or not you're in the driver's seat or passenger seat. There's like, Oh, so, so the car data itself is going to be better than the phone data as a proxy for the car. And maybe this doesn't happen in the next two years, but it's going to happen. And, and no one's really answered me like how this isn't good, bad for Root and Metromile. The one thing some people might say is actually, you know, it's good for them because Root and Metromile are going to be a customer of Autonomo. Um, they're going to use the data to price insurance more effectively, which might be true but it's gonna be true for every other car company. It's not like, you know, so, so, so there's gonna be this new technology, Autonomo, that allows insurance companies to get perfect car data on driving. And that's gonna hurt the people who supposedly have an edge in this, like Root. I, to me, it seems clear, the logic seems clear, like no one's like, I think, corrected me on this yet. Um, but, but for whatever reason, Root and Metro Mile shareholders just don't really talk about it and still live in this world where the app-based thing is going to be the best technology. And I really don't understand it. Perfect. No, that's great. That's right. So I think uh, look, revenue, 400,000 revenue in 2020, they're projecting 3 million in 2021. We can talk valuation in a second, but you know, I, I, I do think this is a venture capital type bet, right? Like they, they raised this series, it was series C in 2020. So this is basically series D, series D to get onto the public markets, right? So whenever you're making a venture capital bet, I think you've correctly identified 
there is a big opportunity here. There is probably some winner take most flywheel effects, whatever you want to call it, all that type of stuff, but it's still young, it's still nascent. So I think when you're making a VC bet, management's huge here. So why don't we talk about management both on the uh, the SPAC sponsor side? We can talk about that second because I think that's secondary to yeah. the actual CEO founder, but I do have some stuff on the SPAC sponsor. So let's talk uh, management, management founder here. So Ben Volkow is the founder CEO. I'd encourage everybody just go listen to his interviews. He had a really good inter six minute one with BCG. I love him. I, I, I love the way he talks about his company. To me, he's very passionate about the company and he isn't trying to sell a stock. I don't think he's promotional. I think he's bad at being promotional, but he definitely just to me feels like an operator and tech guy who's really passionate about the space. That's what I get from him. He's a serial entrepreneur. He built and sold a system called Traffic Systems for like 140 million million dollars, I, I think to five, nine a few years ago. And then while working as an executive at five, nine, I believe he got, he started doing projects in the connected car data space and was like, huh, this is really interesting. I'm going to use it to start my next company. I don't know too much about the other team members of Autonomo. I think they have roughly 150 engineers. I liked, you know, because a company is ultimately about the people at this stage. So I, I went on LinkedIn and I looked at, you know, just a bunch of the employees and, you know, they just have a lot of real engineers. Um, I think their main office is in Israel and they do have an office in San Francisco, I believe, but it seems like, you know, just got talented engineers working on this and you got a really great A plus CEO, in my opinion. Another thing that's kind of connected to management are like, who are the investors of this? If this has potential, you'd assume smart people are starting to get on board. Uh, Bessemer Venture Partners has invested in all all the venture capital rounds for Autonomo, which I think is a little bit of your institutional stamp of approval. Right now, along with the SPAC, they're doing a concurrent pipe. The pipe investors are Fidelity, Senvest, Dell Technologies. So you got some, I, I think, big brand names there. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is I believe the wealthiest non-royal family in Saudi Arabia, they have this head, like, asset manager, Mid Midhawk Capital, that's been buying shares of Autonomo in the open market every day. And I believe uh, own like 25% of the SPAC float or something like that. So you got another smart money investor who's going in and buying a lot of this. And, and that's not to say smart people are wrong all the time, but it is to say like, you know, they've probably done enough due diligence to say this is real and it's not a complete joke of a company, which might be a fear just as someone looking on the outside. How do you know this isn't just a six person company talking a big game? Yep. No, that's great. Uh, we'll, we'll talk uh, investors in a second. I just want to circle back to Ben. So he's a, a serial founder, I believe. Can you talk about some of his previous startups and how, how those went? I don't know much beyond traffic systems. I know he's okay. built that and sold that for 104. Do you, do you know? Is this a rhetorical question? No, 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 no. I, 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 the, traffic's the one I, I've got his uh, crunch base page over here. Traffic's the one I see where he, he built it. He sold it for a good price. And he stayed at, I think it was F5. He stayed there for a while, but I, I was just wondering, you know, it, it does seem like he's a winner. Uh, but it, if it's not somebody who's done like a $10 billion IPO or something, it, it's kind of tough to know, but he does seem like somebody who has successfully done startups and he seems like a good guy to bet on. I was just wondering if there was more. It's true. I, I should know more. I don't. Um, you know, one person on Twitter said, oh, he has a sketchy background. I didn't understand that or discover anything like that. You know, another thing that, you know, is a potential red flag is smart car. I think the U.S. like kind of startup in this space sued Autonomo for copying some code like three years ago. But I don't think that went anywhere um, I, from his interviews. I, I really, really, really like him. Okay. No, look, I, I, I haven't listened to as many as you. I, I have listened to several though. I, in prep for the podcast, I agree. I, I think he's smart. I think his background looks great. You know, I think his background also speaks to someone who's like, you could look at it once, say it looks really good. And then when you dive in, it looks fantastic. And I was just wondering if it was like, you know, fantastic or something. Let's talk investors here. Um, so, you know, I guess, I guess there's two, two pushbacks. You could, there's a, an upside and downside. The upside could be, hey, this is a good group of investors, right? Like Fidelity, Dell, BNP Paribas. There, there's a lot of people investing here. The pushback would be, hey, if this is this revolutionary of a company, why isn't the investor base, you know, why is it Dell? Why isn't it Google? Why is it Fidelity? Why isn't it, um, you know, hot VC startup of the day, whoever you want to, whoever you want to name, uh, you know, 
I, they're merging with software acquisition too. Software acquisition one, which we'll talk about, merged with Curiosity Stream. You know, I'm not saying this is bad, but you know, it's not the Reed Hoffman SPAC or it's not Chamath's new SPAC, which actually back to Metro Mile. But you know, I, I do think it's a good group of investors. But if this was, I, I think the first pushback would be if this is this top tier, why isn't it the super top tier VCs are the ones who are partnering this, raising, taking this public, all that type of stuff? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I think Andreessen Horowitz is in the U.S. competitor smart car. I, I think there is a lot of VCs just, you know, picking in the industry. Not Bessemer is kind of the one aligned with Autonomo. I, I guess that most of these companies say, like, you can't be investing in us and our competitor. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's based in Israel. It's this really new space. I think the valuation is pretty, pretty high. Uh, you know, for most people who say a company with basically negligible revenue. Um, uh, so so, so that, that might all be stuff that's starting to turn people off a bit. Um, why else would there be? I, I don't know. I, 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 I can't, you know, I, I think part of it might be like, you know, $1.4 billion valuation is like really, really high and much higher than I think he's even said it's much higher than they were even trying to raise that just six months ago. Um, but, but, you know, I, I don't know. No, that's great. And then I, I guess I just want to dive one more second here. You know, software, this is software acquisition corp two, which is merging with that them software acquisition corp one merged with curiosity stream. I did a podcast on them in November with uh, Zach silver. Uh, you know, I know that you, I know that you are very skeptical. Uh, you you published a bear cave on Curiosity Stream uh, a couple uh, months ago. You know, so I, I was a little bit surprised. You know, like again, this is a VC bet, and the the SPAC is pro probably the biggest investor person sponsoring it. And it, it strikes me as a little interesting, right? Like their first deal, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating and say you hate it, and then their second deal, they come out and you're you know it's the most bullish thing you're seeing. So how did you kind of think about that? So yeah, the, the, the software, the, the first iteration of this SPAC acquired a video streaming company, Curiosity Stream. Uh, I was more skeptical of the management and the representations being made by management. The management there seemed low quality and promotional and seemed to be misleading investors. The actual company, I think, had some promise, but they were just like, to me, lying to investors about certain metrics that you just can't do. Um, and look at how that how that SPAC traded. I think it went from 10 to 20. The warrants went from one to 10. And like, yep. you know, if you were doing a warrant trade, you made 10 times your money. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I, it's just, it's a little bit of a conflict within me. Like I didn't like their first SPAC, but I love their second SPAC. Um, in the end, you just need to evaluate the company. And, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world if they trade like Curiosity Stream and go to 20 and my warrants go to 10. Um, but, you know, uh, Curiosity Stream is a, a real company. They do, it's not a complete fraud like, you know, maybe a Triteris would be. Um, so it, it's odd, it's not optimal, but, you know, no, nothing's perfect in this world. That's great. That's great. Uh, okay, so let's let's talk. I, I think we've done uh, a lot on the VC opportunity. Well, actually, before we talk valuation, which can be a quick stop, but we, we can just anything else on the opportunity, whether it's you know going back to the business model, the main. Anything else you want to highlight before we we turn over to valuation? Um, you know, it it really is going to be huge. I think McKinsey said you know ten years from now this industry is going to be a three hundred billion dollar industry or something. I don't I don't really care much for figures like that, but it just it's going to be and there's going to be more things that come on top of the car data. It's going to be massive, and there's going to be more and more things you don't think of that come. And then once some things are built, you're going to be able to build things on top of it. it it's going to be a really really big space. How big did McKinsey say it was going to be in ten years? I think McKinsey said the value of connected car data, and they have a public like white paper on this, could be like a three hundred billion dollar industry. In well, you, you know, the famous story is in the '80s. They said that uh, the cell phone market was going to be a hundred million dollars in two thousand, and they missed it by like a hundred times or something because it was. Yeah. You know, they said a hundred, and it was like ten billion or something. So if they say three hundred billion, and they're off by the same margin, we're actually talking thirty trillion, and that's that's some real money there. I, I just, I just, it just makes so much sense. And one more thing I want to talk about on it 
is this fact, you know, has gone from 10 to 11 to about 10. No one's writing about it. No one's talking about it. I, I try to talk to the New York City tech hedge funds and I'm like, hey, have you heard of this? I probably emailed or called three or four smart guys. They're all like, no, nope, haven't looked at it yet. You know, I have a smart friend who might be talking about it, but I haven't looked at it yet. And I'm like, come on. So, so I really do think, you know, sometimes you think, oh, if it's trading at par, I might be, must be stupid. I must be missing something. I, I think in this case, it's really just like not been discovered by the market. And partly because, you know, they're not being too promotional, partly because it's in Israel, it's in this new industry, it's like has negligible revenues, it doesn't screen well, it's odd, you know, no, it just, you can, I can see, like, in the, my ideal world, this thing, no one's talking about it, no one knows about it. In the next two or three months, after they hit a quarter or two, after management gets on an earnings call, after the SPAC closes and you get publicity from that, people will pay attention and say, hey, you know, this isn't a sure bet at all, but it has potential to be huge. Um, no, look, I, I, I think it could go anywhere, but I do think you're right. Like in the past month or so, SPACs, every SPAC has just been demolished. Every SPAC is trading at tr trust value, you know, and I've written about this some, but I do think there is the potential uh, th that there are some babies thrown out with the bathwater, you know, like I, I, I've talked about the Tama Bravo SPAC uh, several times, and I'm not saying I, I love the SPAC, but I'm just saying like Tama Bravo is the best private equity software investor out there. They're bringing a market leading platform uh, public they're doing it at a, a, a rich valuation, but they're also grow, doing something like, forget the rule of 40, this thing's growing like 40% per year, 150% net revenue retention, and they're doing 30% EBITDA margins, despite the fact that they're you know growing massively and doing huge investments. And in a normal market, I think that would go public and people would be going crazy for it. But because the SPAC market is dead, that, and I think some very uh, other very interesting SPACs, Nobody's looking at them because they're still in SPAC mode. They haven't delisted. Everyone at Fidelity is saying, hey, we'll wait till this thing actually merges and then we'll do work on like the cleaned up company once we know everything. So I, I do think there is the potential for opportunity in what you're saying. Absolutely, Andrew. I, I fully agree that. Cool. And let's just talk, you know, again, this is much more on the VC side than value investor side, I would say, but let's talk valuation. You know, the 400,000 revenue in 2020, 2021, 3 million in revenue with negative gross margin, but they say they're going to get to 600 million in revenue by 2025. I, how the heck do I value this thing? How do you think about and trust those projections and everything? I know, I, you know, that, that, that those seem like SPAC projections to me. I don't put much like faith in that. I, I just throw it all out. Um, you know, it's it's tough. The, the John Burbank quote I love that I put at the top of my article was, you know, you know, new things in markets are the most mispriced because they've never happened before. Things that have never happened before are the most mispriced because you can't, you can't like, and in this case, I think it's huge. I think this totally has the potential to be a $50 billion company. If you get lucky and a few things go well, that's just how I think about it. Um, so it's, I, I, I can't give like a great answer other than to say, if they win this, is it going to be huge? Absolutely. And do they have a chance of winning this? Absolutely. So, you know, you take those two things together. Um, it, it sh you, should, you should give it a rich valuation. I, I, I guess you're playing it through the warrants, which I'll remind everyone warrants are extremely risky, but you're playing it through the warrants, which will have five years to expire post this deal is closed. So you're basically just getting a rocket ship bet, right? Like if you're right, and it seems like your bet here is, I think this market is going to be huge. I think there are flywheel effects here. And I think this is the company most likely to capture the flywheel effects. And if I'm right, my warrant, this company goes way up and my warrants are, woo. And if I'm wrong, well, you know, maybe the company's zero, or maybe there's like some value in the data and the team and stuff, but the stock's way down and the warrants are way down. But I'm getting a really asymmetrical bet on being right on the Amazon, the Amazon web services of car data is what I guess you could call them. Sure. And, and the thing that the big risk, Andrew, that I've just not been able to wrap my head around is, is there any risk to this deal closing? Because let's say the deal fails for whatever reason, it's in Israel. Um, that would be terrible for the warrants. I think the warrants have gone from like 40 pre-deal to like $1.50 today. It, it, if the deal just didn't happen, I'd imagine the warrants would fall down to 40 cents or 50 cents. So I'd, you know, 
that would hurt. And I own both the warrants and the stock. So if you're worried about the deal closing, the, the SPAC stock, which currently trades a few pennies above 10, seems like the lower risk play there. Um, you know, it could obviously go below 10 too. Uh, the, the interesting thing about Autonomo is like you said, my understanding of SPAC warrants is they are exercisable at a, like a strike price of 1150. They're good for five years. And if the stock consistently trades above 18 for like 20 of 30 consecutive trading days, like they're callable by the company back, which I'm not sure would happen because Autonomo has enough cash, I believe for the next five years, they've said, because they've raised about $400 million from their pipe and from their uh, SPAC deal. So they're gonna have a lot of cash. Um, and the warrants seem interesting because this does seem like a company that over the next five years, it's either going to do really well or it's going to fail. Like there's not, it, 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 you know, it's not as binary as let's say a, a drug trial company in which the drug works or it doesn't, yep. but it definitely does seem to have this binary aspect. Either the industry grows as like, I'd hope it to go and the execution goes as I hope it to go, or it completely doesn't and it goes to zero. So that's why the SPAC warrants seem a little more interesting to me. The warrants are also pretty liquid. Like some days they trade 10, $20,000 worth. Some days it's a little more. The warrants also seem a little uncoupled, I think is the word people use from the stock where the stock will be down 3% one day, the warrants will only be down 3%. The stock will be up 1%, the warrants will be up 20%. It makes like no, it's it, it just very like weird how the, the, stock, the warrants will be down and the stock will be up and I'll just be left scratching my head, why? Um, so. Another way, like it's interesting to think about it. Again, none of this is investment advice, do your own research. Let's say the stock goes to 20, the stock doubles, the warrants that are at, at like $1.50 are probably gonna go to 750, 5X your money. So, so you get 5X your money on the warrants if the stock doubles. Does this thing have a one in five chance of doubling anytime within the next five years? Uh, I think so. It could double in the first like two weeks. Um, so, you know, smarter people are out there with formulas and options and decay and whatever. But I, I just like thinking what happens if this doubles, you make roughly five times your money on the warrants and does it have a good chance of doubling? Yeah. No, I mean, it, just as someone who's looked at SPACs a lot, I will say like, I, I think the, I think warrants on SPACs can get awfully, I think warrants, options, everything on SPACs and post-SPAC companies can get awfully mispriced and quirky just because, A, you know, if you, if the stock's trading at 10 and the warrants at 1150, a small change in vol makes a huge difference on the price, right? And B, it, you know, a lot of the SPAC buyers in the IPO are hedge funds who are there for a, a risk adjusted, very close to risk free return. So throughout the life of the SPAC kind of until deal close, I do think you have a lot of non economic sellers of the warrants who are just like, hey, I got this thing for basically free. Once I hit X price, I'm going to unload this amount of them or something. Another thing that's, that's, Great, 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 great point, Andrew. And another thing that might contribute to this is I have both Robinhood and Schwab. Uh, Robinhood doesn't let you buy warrants. Um, and I, this so, has so, been a very popular topic of conversation among warrant arbitrage players recently. <laughs> very popular. Oh, so I honestly think if Robinhood let you buy warrants, the, these warrants would all explode, but they don't. But the warrants still should have that value. So because it's kind of shut off from a lot of these retail people, but the SPACs themselves aren't, you get this like, and like what fund, so it's shut off from retail and they're somewhat illiquid. So big funds don't want to play this game of buying the warrants. It's like for somebody managing like sub $10 million, it seems like the I don't know. It seems very attractive, but but again, I'm going to look like an idiot if this thing goes to two and the warrants go to twenty cents, and you know, so hey, you know, it's all about risk adjusted bets, and uh, you know, I th I do think like as we've been discussing about a like as I was re researching this, I was getting a lot more bullish on the opportunity, and uh, you've kind of convinced me on the plywood. But if you said, hey, buy a warrant five years for a dollar that pays off at eleven fifty, or buy the stock at ten on this startup venture capital company, I mean. Every time the answer should be go buy the warrants, because if this fails, the warrants and the stock both do poorly. But if this succeeds, the warrant, the stock's going to be a rocket ship, but the warrants are going to be a rocket ship squared quadrupled or whatever, you know? So if you believe it, I do, I, again, nothing's investing advice, but I do think warrants are the way to play this if you believe in it. 
Andrew, that's a great point that I hadn't even fully thought of. Like, if you view this as like a normal established company, maybe the warrants are rightly priced. But if you view this as like a total VC bet, it's either a 10x or a zero, then the warrants are probably very underpriced. Um, and, and you people just, it's a big public company. So, so they don't think of it like that, but it is really still kind of like a VC stage bet. Um, I, 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 the thing that frustrates me is if someone's watching this and I'm an idiot and missing something big, email me and tell me what is wrong. But I've tried talking to 20, 30 smart people about this. And, you know, I get a little pushback on the smart car lawsuit, um, a little pushback on, oh, the SPAC projections are a little too high. I haven't really like felt that anyone's given some pushback that really changed my sentiment on the company. Uh, one thing that we didn't discuss about that's in the back of my head is how will autonomous vehicles impact this? Like what happens if autonomous vehicles, you know, this is a play, uh, autonomous is a play on the far future. What if like autonomous vehicles Great are point. Yep. 10 years from now, like will this data, you, like insurance probably is going to be a lot different. Um, this is going to happen. I, but I, I'm not too worried about that. That's like no one in the next two years is going to be like, oh, this is a worthless company because autonomous vehicles are coming so soon. What, one more final thing I forgot to mention is, you know, gas is going away. Everything is starting to go electric. Um, uh, gas taxes are a huge source of revenue for governments and maintaining highways and that sort of thing. I, I believe the way that, you know, governments are thinking of re replacing that is, no more gas tax because everything's electric based, but we're going to have a per mile tax. And Autonomo would have the data to really enforce a go. Uh, Autonomo, the middleman is going to be that person who I think governments turn to to say, hey, and especially if it's going to be more complicated than per mile, is it going to be per mile, but surcharges if you're in cities or drive during peak hours or stuff like that, then Autonomo is going to be like really that middleman. So, so, so by kind of, for the one thing I would push back so hard on is if somebody believes there's only going to be two or three or four use cases or a few companies or like the market for this is small. It's going to be massive and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm very confident about that. Autonomo might not win, but, you know, even if you didn't like Autonomo for whatever reason, like I I'm really interested in this space too. And it's just one that's not being talked about a lot right now. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, this has been a great discussion. You know, I I I've tried to lay some bear case out, but look to anyone who's listening, if you're interested in the company, Send Edwin a tweet, send me a tweet. Let us know, you know, what we missed, what uh, what you think we we're right on, all that type of stuff. It, it, I think you and I are the only people who are even talking about this. I'm, mainly you, I'm talking about it because of you. But, you know, it, it'd be great to hear from other people if you're listening, G give us some uh, feedback. Edwin, any, anything else you want to say on this before we wrap this up? Andrew, I absolutely love this. Thanks so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Hey, well, having a, a short seller come on and pitch their VC long idea is uh, unique, but I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you having you coming on and uh, looking forward to the next one, whether it's a long or short idea. But uh, thanks again for coming on and we'll chat soon. Bye-bye, Andrew. Thank you.